you don't realize how much of me taking sips of drinks I edit out of these videos. <laughs> Hello my beautiful bibliophiles, my name is Jill and I am here to do my mini wrap up. I don't know why I had that weird voice, I, it was like channeling Julia Child. <laughs> Any hoops, I'm here to do my mini wrap up. The first book I'll talk about very briefly because I don't have it, I gave it to my friend. It is The Kiss Quotient by Helen Huang. I don't have a lot to say about this book, this is a uh, romance book, you know I don't read romance. I picked it up kind of on a whim because I saw Jack Edwards do a review of it and I was like oh this sounds like of all the romances that I hear about um this might be a little bit up my alley. I was like if I'm gonna try one it'll be this one and it was you know exactly what I thought it was going to be. Um neither good nor bad. It's if you don't know the stories it's a a woman who she's autistic and she works in like the tech industry and like works with algorithms is what it's constantly referred to as and she um, is afraid that she's bad at relationships and bad at sex so she hires an escort to teach her how to be good at things so that she can get married and like basically get her mother her family off her back and um and obviously instant mutual attraction when she meets with the escort and you can fill in the blanks exactly what you think will happen happens um it was fine <laughs> I think the writing was fine I, I just like I just these are not the genre for me so uh, I read it in literally three hours. It was the fastest book I've read all year. Um, so the writing was fine. Again, it was fine. It was fine. You don't come to me for romance recommendations, so I'm done talking about that now. Um, the next one I'll talk about very briefly is one I've already reviewed on my channel. It's Son of Elsewhere by Elamine Abdul Mahmoud, and I have a full review of it in my last video. I will link it in the cards down below. But this is um, his memoir. He's a Canadian like journalist, pop culture kind of commentator. He does like some news things, uh, he does a bunch of podca uh, podcasts, and I just really enjoy Elamin as a human, and I really liked this book. This is his memoir of, of immigrating to Canada as a teenager, or he was 12 when he moved here from Sudan. It's very much the story of what it's like to be not only, you know, coming of age in Canada, you know, in the same, around the same time I did in the early 2000s, but also learning your language, <laughs> leaving your whole family and history behind, and kind of dealing with um, immigrant parents and also trying to, and being an immigrant yourself, but also trying to integrate into this new world. It's a beautifully written, astute, clever, funny memoir, and I really, really enjoyed it, and I would highly recommend. Another book I will briefly mention here, because it's for another video for another project I'm working on, but I will briefly mention that I read it, um, which is There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job by Kikuko Tsumura, translated from the Japanese by Polly Barton. Um, this is kind of like uh, told in like five acts. It's about a girl who's looking for who, well not a girl, she's a woman, she's probably in her 30s, and she um, has left her last job because of extreme burnout. And we never know what that job actually is, um, but she has this kind of, um, I'm laughing as it's quite funny, she has this like uh, job advisor who she goes to see and increasingly she gives her more obscure and easier jobs um, to help her with the burnout. And each kind of the five sections is one of the jobs that she gets and they get increasingly obscure and funny and weird and like strange things happen. This is very classically Japanese in the sense of there's some kind of, there's like a little bit of elements of quirkiness and like some elements of like um, the unexplained, which I think are really interesting in here, um, but I won't say much more about it other than I will say that I enjoyed it, and that's all I'm going to say about this book. The next book I read I want to talk about at length because I have a lot to say about it. It is A Fine Balance by Roy Hinton Mystery. This was has been on my TBR for many, many years. I think I've had this for, like, I'm going to say nine years, like, since I moved to this city, and um, it's on, like, a, the list of CBC's 100 novels that I've been working through for many years, and it's also just, like, a a, a big a big epic family kind of story which I really enjoy. So these are all reasons I really wanted to pick it up. This follows four main characters. There's Ishvar and Om, Om Prakash, uh, their uncle. Uh, Ishvar is the uncle, Om Prakash is the nephew, and then there's a woman named Dina, Auntie Dina, or Dina Auntie, and then there is um, a young man named uh, Menek. And they are, they all come into each other's lives unexpectedly at a, at a crucial moment in history. Um, what this book looks at, I was gonna say briefly, it's, it's only probably a, a chapter or two, probably only a single chapter on each of these characters' backstories, on their family's backstories, um, and most of this book is following present day, which is not what I actually expected. I expected this to be a much more sprawling novel, but it probably only covers... I don't even know if it's, if it's specifically clear in this book how much time it covers. It might be a year, maybe a bit more than a year. Um, but Ishvar and Omprakash are from a, 
uh, lower caste. It's, so I should say it's set in 1975, which was during something called the emergency in India. And I didn't know anything about this particular part of history. And I don't know much. I did read a little bit as I was kind of reading this book. I was like, I want to kind of know a little bit more about that particular political moment. Um, but what I understand is basically it's like when it became kind of a police state where there was things were getting out of control and the, um, uh, the president needed to like take back control of, of a sprawling population and just a lot of unrest and so there became a bit of a police state where police were out of control and people were being rounded like poor people and people were living on the streets and people who um basically people who were not rich were being like rounded up and just lots of horrible things were happening um and it really got out of control and then um uh, we follow these four people and how their lives are affected by that. It doesn't actually say where this takes place. So it takes place in a big city. Um, my guess is that it is the um, New Delhi because of something that happens in the end where uh, Manek comes back to the city to visit, well, his, like to visit his family like eight years later and they say the capital. So I think it's New, De New Delhi, but I don't know. <laughs> they, they never they never say that specifically in this book. Ishvara and Om Prakash come from a small, a small village outside of the city. Um, their family's from a lower caste and um, their uh, Ishvar's father had, um, they, they were like, their caste was leather workers and they were treated, you know, absolutely terribly. Um, again, I, I'm, I do not feel comfortable at all talking about the caste system in India, but I'm sure you've heard of it, uh, where people were stuck into their particular um, designation of caste and they were a low class, which means that people could treat them terribly and make them do things for them and, and not get paid properly and or at, at all. and had to live a certain way and you know uh, uh, just a very difficult uh, and kind of ingrained historical system and so um, Ishvar's father wanted his children to not be leather workers he didn't want them to have like the smell of like leather on their body he talks with a lot about how that marks them as lower caste and also like limits their ability to move up in the world and have a better life so he sends his two children um, Ishvar and his brother, when they're children, to go to learn to be tailors. And then in turn, uh, Ishvar's brother sends his son, Om, to go and learn to be a tailor as well when he's a child. Um, there's, you know, there's a story that happens to the family and why Ishvar and Om end up in the city um, to try to find a better life. Then there is Dina, who has this difficult childhood, who her father died when she was young. And um, he was a doctor, but he was not a rich doctor. He really cared about taking care of people regardless of if they could pay or if they had the right, you know, if if they're the right kind of cast or the right that status. And so that meant that when he died, they didn't have a lot of money. But her older brother became responsible, of course, for her and for their mother. And he was a huge bully <laughs> and uh, he really tried to dictate her life. Um, and Dina is a really interesting character because she deviates from, she she's kind of constantly deviating in and out of like what her brother wants for her life. Um, and she she makes a marriage that is not of her brother's choosing and then you know her life unfolds from there and then Manek is a the son of a friend of hers who um, is coming to the city to get an education um, his parents are actually fairly well off but they live in the mountains and they want him to have a better life um, and they send him off to the city to um, to get a degree and he doesn't want to go but he does anyway and then living in the dorms is horrible and he um, writes to his parents and they find him this lodging house which is with um, Dina and Dee. So this is how they all live in each other's lives. I have to say, there's, I'm, as I'm talking and I'm telling you the story, I'm remembering so many things that happened in this book and it's not very often that I think that a book that is this long needs to be this long and this book needs to be this long. I'm kind of in awe about how this book is crafted because Nothing feels wasted in here. Nothing feels unnecessary. Nothing feels gratuitous in terms of just throwing in extra things to, you know, just the writer wanted to put stuff in. Um, it feels like everything truly adds to the story. When Ishvar and Om um, move to the city first, of course, they are poor from the country, so they end up living in a slum. And uh, the way that that is all described is, um, again, it's not gratuitous in any way. And at first, I don't think I even realized that that's what was happening. I think I was kind of um, this kind of slow dawning of like where they were living and who they were interacting with and I think he he paints this really fascinating picture of this community of people and uh, that's the other thing I think is really successful at this book is that there are a lot of side characters who kind of come and go out of all the characters lives especially Ishvar and Om because they are the ones who travel the most and they interact with a lot of different people and 
fascinating, super interesting characters who all have a very important role to play at some point in the novel. Again, very smartly crafted, very, um, uh, just like little, like, at the end of the book when I was finishing up, I was like, gosh, I would never have thought that that particular thing that happened, you know, 400 pages ago is gonna play, actually has a role to play a play out in this way in the last like 40 pages. I was endlessly impressed with the capacity of this novel, what it was able to address, the scope it was able to take care of without ever feeling overwhelming or without ever feeling like overdone or overwrought. There's a real um, intelligence and sleekness to the writing of the story, to, to, the, to the way that these characters are showcasing um, so many of the of the societal problems, challenges um, that exist for each different kind of level of society. So we have, you know, four characters th of three different very distinct classes and um, different kind of financial <laughs> securities. And each of them have, a, have their own hardship in their own way to the point where it is a, like actually really a problem. And, but they're all so, so different and they all, um, have different needs and they all have different risk levels. Um, you know, because uh, Ishvar and Om Prakash for a long time are, you know, have precarious housing situations, they are at risk of being um, taken by the police. Um, then there's Auntie Dina who has um, a risk of not being able to pay her rent properly and then her losing her apartment that she's had for years because of, you know, some corruption and you know, government schemes. And then there's Manek who has at the risk of you know, not being able to complete his degree, but also um, just feeling super uncomfortable in this whole new world. And he really wants to have the life with his parents, but there's this conflict there about um, the risk of the future. If he, if he doesn't have a proper education, um, will he be able to sustain the lifestyle that he's had growing up? So it's a really fascinating structure of a novel and it is bleak. Man, it's bleak. <laughs> I'm like, I finished this book and I was like, it does not end um, on a joyous, there's, this is not, it's not a Shakespeare comedy, there's no wedding. But throughout this, there's also a lot of humor and a lot of joy and a lot of friendship. And it's just a really remarkable piece of writing. There is no other word for it. This is a masterpiece and I'm so glad I read it. I will give a caution here. There's a lot of like bodily harm in here, um, violence, a lot of, um, if you're squeamish, there's lots of uncomfortable things happening here. Uh, yeah, I just say, you know, the trigger warning for basically everything that could possibly happen to a person happens in this book. Um, I will say it's not gratuitous to the point of like, there, you know, any kind of violence or um, assault or something is not gratuitously drawn out or graphically described. But it is in here. Um, and because it, these are things that happen to real people, these are things that these people actually experienced. So, um, yeah, I would just kind of put that um, the content warning out there, but this is a masterpiece. I'm so glad I read it. And I think if you, you know if you're in the mood for this type of book and I think that it's um, a fascinating journey to take. Um, yeah, what, what, what an experience. Okay, I have less to say about the rest of them because <laughs> they're just shorter. Um, so I read the short story collection called Arid of Dreams by uh, Duanwad Pimwana and translated from the Thai by Mu Mui Pupaksakul. I think, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, this um, is a great cover and this was gifted uh, to me by my friend Jen in a book exchange that we did and this is a collection of short stories uh, set in Thailand and I really enjoyed it. There were some of course I enjoyed more than others. I think what I liked about this was the title story was excellent. It was the first story in the book. I thought it was, there was some really interesting commentary on relationships with women that I thought were, was unexpected and quite interesting. And the rest of it I thought was quite good. It's been a, a month since I've read it and I have forgotten many of the stories, but there's a couple that have stuck in my mind. And I think it's kind of all you can really hope for, for short story collections. But what I've kind of realized as I was reading this, and I've read a couple of other short story collections this year, but gosh, I just like short story collections a whole lot. I had never anything set in Thailand before, so that was also really interesting. Just fun to read a book from somewhere I haven't read uh, any stories from before. And uh, just affirming that I need to read more short story collections. I finally got around to reading Lean Fall Stand by John McGregor. And this came out last year and I was like stoked for it. And then I just forgot I owned it and didn't read it. This is the story of a man named Robert, they call him Doc, who um, has worked in Antarct Antarctica for most of his career, kind of as a guide or doing research work down there. And he's, you know, in his middle ages, middle ages, middle ages. <laughs> he's his middle age. <laughs> he has worked there for many years. 
and there's an incident that happens there's a storm and there's miscommunication and he ends up having a stroke in the middle of this kind of crisis um so he ends up coming back to england and his wife then has to take care of him in a way that they haven't really been together for this long or this kind of intimate because he has spent so much time away from her so they have to relearn how to be together uh and how to do how to live because they've just had this massive shift in their lives i listened to this on audio and i really recommend that experience because this is written from uh not fully from robert's perspective but when he's talking re relearning how to speak um and never he never fully gains the ability to speak the way he did before the stroke but when he's practicing and the kind of the days and months after the stroke um the way that, that he's speaking uh is so, is very much like a, a stroke patient would speak and I um I had an uncle who had a stroke when I was eight years old and he, we spent a lot of time with him in my childhood he spent summers with us um and I remember working with him like specifically on on speaking um and I remember watching him try to learn to speak again and he has these kind of vocal tics where he repeats the same phrases over and over again because they're other oh, way that you know your brain kind of rewires when you have a stroke and I don't I, I don't understand the signs of it but I know that this is what happens because I have first-hand experience of it and I think reading it because I had the copy and I was kind of following along um doesn't have the same effect as listening to it because I think you know if, just, if you're just reading like kind of single words after each other it's not quite as effective as hearing them and hearing how it would sound to be a person um trying to have a conversation trying to work together with someone um, to, you know, <laughs> build, build a dialogue and then, um, it's frustrating for everyone involved. I think this was, that was so effective to have that experience in audio. And I think it is very true to what it is like to be, um, living with and, and spending time with someone who is recovering from a stroke. Something else I really appreciated in this book was the way that John McGregor kind of writes around a feeling. So instead of outright stating <laughs> that, um, Doc's wife is suffering because she is. It's very obvious that she is. He doesn't say it. He will write around it in a way that, as I was reading it, I felt so overwhelmed and I felt so um, miserable and exhausted about this new life that she has to deal with. And she never complains in the book. She never takes a moment to kind of feel sorry for herself. But we, as the reader, know that that is what she's feeling because that is how that that story is shaped and I think that's really smart writing. I think this was an excellent book and I think, you know, I, I it's not a book for, for everyone I don't think. I think that I particularly found this interesting because of uh, my uncle and because of how much time we spent together um, growing up um, and I, I just felt it was really amazing to see that played out in a book I'd never seen it before in this way and in such, such a realistic way and it really um, worked for me and um, yeah so I thought this was a, a really smart and a compassionate book. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I have a book I did not like very much this month, so I won't talk about it too much because I know others really loved it. This is How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Negamatsu. This is supposedly, <laughs> I will say supposedly, a kind of fantasy sci-fi story about um, um, like a plague or some kind of um, pandemic that breaks out when these um, workers in the Arctic uncover a virus from, you know, the the ages gone by and it, it's exposed to the world. It's things called the Arctic virus and then each chapter then follows or is the, it's really a short story collection. Each story and, and they are all connected by this common thread. They're all following people in the years post the virus being uh, exposed to the to the planet. Um, each story follows a different person or sometimes they're connected um, but it's a different voice for each one over many years post the virus and how the world has changed to adapt to um, at first it's mostly children who are getting sick and dying and then uh, other family members throughout time. Um, this book I, I first of all I don't know if I actually knew it was about a pandemic. I must have because I, I don't know why. I did read the jacket before I picked it up. I wanted this to be more sci-fi, I think, is why it was not, this didn't work for me. I also thought the writing wasn't great. I mean, my, my number one complaint about this book was that every single story felt exactly the same in terms of voice. There was not a single different voice in this book. And they were all told from drastically different perspectives. Uh, but I would never be able to tell you that from the writing style. And I think that was not very effective. 
I also think that um, because of the way this was written, I did not invest in a single character in this book at all. And I think if you're going to have this type of story, you need to invest in someone. And I just didn't feel like I didn't feel anything. Like there's one, the, one of the very first stories in here is about this like um, children are getting very sick and dying, and they and they cannot get better. And so there's this like theme park that the parents take children to when they know they're going to die and they give them one last day of great fun and then there's like this roller coaster that because of like the zero gravitational pull or something they like die on the roller coaster and <laughs> such such a dark premise um but I also didn't care at all <laughs> about any of the characters in that like I feel I felt like I was being like he was trying very very hard to make me care and I just didn't and I think that this is where I think the writing was the problem for me um and maybe also just I wanted it to be a bit more sci-fi because it just wasn't enough sci-fi for me it was a very um it just felt like kind of literary fiction that wanted it to be more sci-fi and he kind of throws a couple of things here and there there's like a pig that can talk and which again just felt I just felt silly it didn't feel sci-fi-ish to me and then there's um I don't know, there's some other things, there's kind of this moment where like people are kind of floating around in this kind of afterlife type of area. I don't know, it just didn't work for me at all. I think I'm in the minority of people in this book um, because I've seen a lot of people, a lot of my friends have read this and really loved it. A lot of people on YouTube have read it and loved it. I know Books and La La Kayla is one of our favorite books of the whole year. Um, not surprising because we have the exact opposite taste. Um, so go watch her videos and figure out if you want to read it, but just did not work for me at all. The last book I read this month was The Fortune Men by Nadifa Mohammed, and this was uh, a finalist for the Booker Prize last summer. This is the last, I think the last one I had read on the shortlist? Maybe. Um, I read a lot of them last year, but this was, I was very interested in reading this, and this was picked for my book club for this month. Um, and first of all, <laughs> I didn't realize this was based on a true story, uh, until I got to, like, maybe 20, 20 pages into this book. Um, I think it maybe tells you, like, in, on the blurb that this is based on a true story, uh, but I just didn't register that <laughs> when I was reading this book. This is the story of Mahmoud, who is a man from Somalia who ends up kind of, he's a sailor on ships and he ends up, um, finds his way to England, to Wales, where he meets a woman, uh, a white woman who becomes his wife and they have children together. And then, um, and he's like a, a difficult man. He's not well liked. He's, um, he's had some petty crimes. He's a bit of a philanderer. Like he's not a, he's not a, He's not a top-notch member of society, let's put it that way, but he's also a very sympathetic character. You know, he's not, it's, I, we talked about a book club, and I was like, you can't hate this guy. Like, he's written so sympathetically that it's impossible to really hate him. Um, and uh, he gets convicted of a crime. Uh, there's a woman who is murdered in a shop, and it's a very violent and nasty murder, and uh, he gets convicted of this crime that he did not commit, and then he um, is hanged for it. And this looks at the process of kind of before the crime, after the crime, after he is kind of accusing, he doesn't really believe that he doesn't understand what's going on really because he's innocent. Um, and then what happens kind of after the after the legal case. Um, I think this book, my I have I am conflicted about this book because um, many of the parts of the book were quite good. I think there's moments in here that are. Um, like reflections of the past that are really excellently written. Um, a move remembering his own childhood in uh, British Somaliland and then him traveling around a little bit before he ends up uh, in in England, uh, in Britain, in Wales. Um, and then those parts are beautiful. And then the parts about um, the, the, the sister of the woman who was murdered is also kind of focused on in here and her backstory is also really well written. There's lots of diversity in here. There's like people from all over the globe kind of who are in this particular town. Um, the woman who's murdered is a is a uh, the daughter of a Russian Jewish immigrant to Wales. So there's lots of interesting things being said about all of this. Um, but for me, I think this book was either too, like it, it needed to be longer because I I feel like it, it sets itself up to be this kind of epic novel, the way that begins with a couple of different chapters from a bunch of different characters' perspectives, and then it never follows through on those elements. So I was expecting this kind of epic story, and it ends up being a very kind of pedestrian kind of crime novel uh, of, a, of a true crime. And I don't know, I just... Um, it didn't deliver what I what I wanted from it. I had high hopes and it was, they weren't shattered, but they weren't like fully met. So I enjoyed this book, but I don't think it was uh, a masterpiece, I guess. I wish, I wanted it to be a little bit different, a little bit better. Yeah, so this was just like, 
a minor miss for me, but it wasn't terrible. What a nothing sentence to end on. <laughs> no dramatics here to end this video. I would love to know down in the comments below what you read this month. I would love to know if you have any thoughts or feelings about what I read this month. Leave it all in the comments down below. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon. Bye.